Amen? And he'll give it to you. Somebody else. Someone else. Word for the Lord. A testimony. All right. Praise God. It's been a wonderful week, hasn't it, church? I know there's probably a lot of folks that are here this morning that are tired. But you know what? We got another... What time is it? We got another three hours. <laughs> Amen, church. I'm just messing with you. You know what? We, we come in here on Sunday morning, it doesn't matter for how long, we're here to worship and praise His holy name. Amen? After all, He's worth it. Praise God. I want you to flip over to Hebrews chapter 4. I want to just set the context for you here briefly with two verses, 9 and 10. The Scripture says this, it says, There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God, for he that is entered into his rest, he also has seized from his own works, as God did from His. Let's pray. Father God, we come to You once again. We're thankful for the time You've given us here this morning. Father, we pray that uh, each one within the sound of my voice would examine their heart this morning. Father, we pray that each one within the sound of my voice would examine their relationship with Your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, I pray that today that you would be with me, that you would bring all things back to my remembrance. Father, I cannot do this without you, but Father, I pray that your word would go forth, that it would be your voice that we would hear. And Father, I pray that today you would give increase. Father, I pray that today would be the day of salvation, that, that now would be the accepted time. And Father, we, we ask you that you would be with those individuals that are going to be following your command of believer's baptism here today. Father, I pray that you'd put a hedge of protection around them, that you'd be round about them. Father, I pray that they would have a desire to get into your word, that they would have a desire to grow and glorify your name. Now, Father, we love you. We thank you for it's in Jesus' name that we pray. And amen. Guys, so far we've been going through this series on servanthood. Believe it or not, we've now made it to week number seven in this series. And we began this thing by defining a servant. And I just want to kind of catch you up here just for a few minutes here this morning. We defined a servant, and we said a servant is one that serves others, one that performs the duties given by the master, and one that answers problems and fulfills needs. I want you to remember that this is opposite of an individual that brings problems. You know, a lot of people are good about pointing out problems. A lot of people are good with bringing problems to you, but most of the time they do not have a solution. The church needs more individuals that will serve others. The church needs more people that are eager to serve after God. And, they, and the church needs more people that are eager to uh, solve problems and fix things. Amen? Now, we began this series by examining the heart of a servant. Now, the first thing that we saw in week one was the first characteristic of humility. Humility. Humility takes the focus off of ourselves and it puts all of the focus on others. Humility loves to give all of the glory and all of the credit to God because, guys, after all, it's not about us. The Bible says to humble yourselves, therefore, and that He would be the one to lift you up. See, the way to up is not up. The way to up is actually down. Then the second characteristic that we saw in the heart of a servant is one that is willing and serves voluntarily. Isn't it great when somebody sees a problem, Pastor Rick, somebody sees the problem and they just take care of it? Folks, that's wonderful. Just hint, hint, that is wonderful to your leadership team at this church. It's wonderful whenever somebody says, hey, we need a group of people to come in and clean. And there's all kinds of people who says, well, me, 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 me. I want to do that. Or, or whenever we say, you know what, we need a group of people to come in and, uh, and, and, and do this. Me, I want to go. Send me. I want to do that. I'm willing. I, I want to serve voluntarily. What about when you got to go change the dirty diaper in the nursery? What about that? Is there anybody? Richard just pointed at Anita. Is there anybody that's actually holding their hand up and saying, me, 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 me? You see, we have a church full of servants. Because at Bloomingdale, there are people that are raising their hand and saying, me, send me, 
send me. And guys, I can't stand to change dirty diapers. It almost makes me sick to my stomach. Ask Amanda. Every time that Cody and Caden used to do that, praise God we're out of the diaper stage, but it would almost make me puke every single time. So let's move along. The next characteristic of a servant that we've already seen is love. You guys remember in John chapter 13 when Jesus was washing the feet of the disciples. He was not giving them an ordinance to the church that you're supposed to wash feet. He was showing them His love for them and He was teaching them a lesson in servanthood. Remember that love is an action word and that's what Jesus did. He put love into action and He washed the dirty feet of His disciples. The Creator washed the feet of His creation. Jesus Christ washed the feet of those disciples that had just been arguing over who was going to be the greatest in the kingdom. Jesus washed the feet of his betrayer, Judas Iscariot. Why would he do that? Well, simply the answer is nothing but love. Jesus said to love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. And I want you to also remember that love is receiving Guys, it takes humility and it takes love to serve others. But it takes more humility and more love to let others serve you. Amen? You see, most of us think that we got everything together and we don't need any help and that we can make it on our own. I want you to remember that Peter said, Jesus, you're not washing my feet. You guys remember that, John chapter 13. No, you're not washing my feet, but Jesus said this, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. Jesus makes it perfectly clear that if you try to stand on your own, then you have no part with Him. Praise God that we have a body of servants that is united, and we're here for one another. Amen? Amen? Are you here for your neighbor? Now, don't get me wrong. We're here to worship and serve Christ. Amen? We're here to worship and serve the Father. But you want to serve the individual that's sitting beside of you, I hope and pray. Amen? The next characteristic is faithfulness. We saw this on Mother's Day, how Ruth was faithful to God, how she was faithful to her family, and there was a great reward for that faithfulness. And that came by way of Boaz, who was the kinsman redeemer. I want you to notice the next thing. Available. You guys remember that? You see that one right there? That's a biggie. That's a biggie. Luke chapter 10, the parable of the Good Samaritan. There was a certain man that fell among thieves. They beat him. They stripped him. They took everything they had. They left that individual for dead. Here comes a priest. He sees the individual. He sees the need. And he passes by on the other side. He basically said, I'm not available. Levite, one step better, but he's two steps worse. The Levite walks up to the man that had been beaten. He sees his need, then passes by on the other side. He says, I'm not available. But here comes the Samaritan. Here comes the Samaritan. He sees the need. He sees the need, which is exactly what we do as servants. We should see the need, and then he reacted to that need. He said, you know what? I'm available. He probably had somewhere he had to be. He probably had a busy schedule, but he made himself available. Then on Memorial Day, we saw sacrifice. We put servanthood into action. And we saw that part of being a servant of God is sacrifice. And I want you to remember that sacrifice is the giving of myself, my time, my possessions, my energy for something that I deem valuable and something that I deem worthy. If you got something sitting in the corner of the barn that you haven't used in 20 years and you say, you know what, I don't need that no more. I'm going to give it to the church. That's not sacrifice. Sacrifice is something that you deem valuable, something that you deem worthy. And folks, the most valuable thing that we have to give, it's not in your pocketbook, it's your time. And by the way, we got a couple more weeks of this uh, series and we're going to be getting to stewardship, which is going to involve time. I'm sure you guys are really looking forward to that. The next thing that we saw was obedience. Last week we had VBS kickoff Sunday, which is always a blast. I love that. We looked at King David Last Sunday morning and throughout the week, he was a man after God's own heart. He desired the Word of God. And he had a desire to be obedient to the Word of God. He was one that listened to the voice of God. And that's exactly what we're supposed to do as servants of Jesus Christ. That's us. That's us. Amen? Now, this morning I had planned on bringing you the two T's of servanthood. One of those is thankfulness, and the other one is trustworthiness. But as I went throughout the week and things began to happen in VBS, the Lord began to 
sort of move me in a different direction. This morning, I want you to understand this. Even though all of those things that I just mentioned, a servant is to do. That's us. That's what we're to be. Those are our characteristics. A servant also needs one thing that is absolutely crucial in their life. And that's rest. How many people here had something to do with VBS last week? I want, if you did, I want you to stand up. I don't care if you went and made five copies. I don't care if you turned on the coffee pot. Come on, stand up. Anybody that had anything to do with Vacation Bible School, I want you to please stand up. Anything. Do you guys see what it takes? Now, this isn't everybody. This isn't everybody. But do you guys see what it takes to be able to make something like this happen? Do you know how many hours went into this? If, if you guys get an opportunity, come up and give Mel a big old hug before the end of the day. Because Mel did a fant... She's the one that coordinated every single bit of this. You guys can have a seat. She coordinated every bit of it. She's a servant of God. But do you know what we need after we've been serving... You know what we need after a long week? At, folks, we've got to have rest. Everyone has to have it. What is rest? Rest is this. It simply means to cease or to abstain from labor. Rest is a theme that we see all throughout the Scripture. You can go all the way back to the very beginning. Go all the way back to Genesis. In the very beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And on the seventh day, what did God do, church? He rested. The Bible says this, Genesis chapter 2, verse 1 through 3. It says, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God ended His work, which He had made, and He rested on the seventh day from all His work, which He had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it He had rested from all His work, which God created and made. First of all, you guys need to understand this right out of the gate. God did not rest because he was tired. It was, he, he could have gone on another six million days doing the exact same thing he did in those six days. He could have gone on another six million years. He did not rest because he was tired. He rested to set a standard for mankind. Our lives get so cluttered up with things that we think that we ought to be doing that we forget and we don't understand how we were designed. God designed you in His own image. He knows you, and He knows that you need rest, which is exactly why He commanded the children of Israel to rest on the Sabbath. That's the fourth of the Ten Commandments. He said, on the seventh day, I want you folks to rest. Now listen, I'm not getting into a thing on the Sabbath today. That's not my point. That's a whole other message, and we may do that one of these days. But the point of this is that you do need rest, and rest does not come naturally to us, does it? Does it? No, it doesn't. I don't know about you, but sometimes I feel like if I'm not there, things aren't going to get done. I shouldn't feel that way. So that's my fault. Sometimes we think if we're not there, then all of a sudden the world is going to stop turning for some reason. No, no, no. We need rest. It does not come to us naturally. We live in the most workaholic country in the entire world. Did you guys realize that? American employers on average, start off an employee with one week of vacation. Do you know that countries in Europe start off with 35 days of vacation? You see, they get it. You guys are jealous. Are you? I mean, I'm moving over to Spain or Greece. Huh? They are smarter than we are, I think. But we have too much pride, Pastor Rick, to be able to realize that. Our employers, our employers expect the employees to work a crazy amount of hours. And listen to this, technology makes it even worse. Guys, I spent 20 years almost in the building materials sales industry, okay? I have my phone on 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And Ron, I did that on purpose because if I had a customer that wanted to get a hold of me, I wanted him to be able to get a hold of me. But here's what happens. When you supposedly go on vacation, man, you got that cell phone that's tied to your hip right there, guess what happens? Huh? It rings. Right. And you're supposedly on vacation. Have you guys ever had that happen? You guys are looking at me like, what in the world? What's going on here this morning? 
What about this? And I, Richard was in sales, and I think he can probably attest to this. You're sitting at the house during the evening, getting ready to eat dinner with your family. Man, customer calls the cell phone, or you've got to get on the iPad and send an email, or you've got to get on your laptop and do something. You see, that's the way it works. Technology all of a sudden makes us busier. You're getting ready to go to bed, 10 o'clock at night, 11 o'clock at night. A customer calls you and says, hey, David, hey, it's, it's usually Mark Howard. You remember him? Hey, I need a load of shingles first thing in the morning. Here it is, 11 o'clock at night. You're not getting any rest. We need to understand that we've got to take time to unwind. We've got to take time to get away. We need to relax a little bit. There are times that we have just got to, to chill out. We've got to take time to recharge our batteries. We just have VBS one week. And I could tell by Friday everybody was starting to drag, just a little bit slower, walking in the doors. We've got to take time to recharge our batteries. We, we have to set boundaries around our time. Rest is a life or death situation. Without rest, do you realize that you cannot function? Without rest, you cannot even survive. You've got to have rest. And not just from physical fatigue, guys, but also from mental fatigue. And you also need spiritual rest, which is exactly why God has given us a day of rest. Now listen, I don't want you guys getting me wrong this morning. That does not mean that you go to bed fully charged, right? That means that you need rest because you've been working. Amen? We also live in a society where there's a lot of people that don't want to work. Now, I understand that there are people that cannot work. I get that. I understand that there are people that need help getting on their feet. I get that. But there are people that simply do not want to work. All they want to do is sit on the front porch. The Bible says if a man does not work, then he ought not to eat. When we go to bed, we ought to be going to bed with no energy because we have been working our tail ends off the entire day. God has not designed us to have a bunch of free time. He's designed you to work. Amen? That's why you need rest. Flip over to Mark chapter 6 with me this morning. Mark 6. Mark chapter 6. I want you to just look at a couple verses. The disciples needed rest because they'd been out working. Verse 30 and 32. You see, Jesus had sent them out. If you look earlier in the chapter, Jesus had sent them out two by two. I want you to look there starting in verse 30. The Scripture says this, And the apostles gathered themselves together unto Jesus and told Him all things, both what they had done and what they had taught. What they had done, what they had taught, they'd been working. And he said unto them, Come ye yourselves apart into a desert place, and rest a while. You guys see that? For there were many coming and going, and they had no leisure so much as to eat, and they departed into a desert place by ship privately. Jesus sent them out two by two. He sent them out to preach the message of repentance, which, by the way, is a message that needs to be preached from the pulpits in America in a bad, bad way. And he also gave them power to cast out demons. And when they came back, Jesus immediately picked up on that these disciples needed to rest. He, needed, uh, he realized that those guys needed to refocus spiritually. Jesus Christ even took time to rest. Flip back to Mark chapter 4. Mark 4. Look there at verse 35 through 39. It says, In the same day, when the evening was come, he said unto them, Let us pass over unto the other side. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship, and there were also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship, so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, he referring to Jesus, asleep on a pillow. And they awake him, and said unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose, and rebuked the wind, and said unto the sea, Peace be still, and the wind ceased, and there was a great calm." Now, folks, that, that passage right there is loaded. I don't have time to get into this passage. But what I want you to see this morning is that Jesus Christ was there in the boat and He was resting. He was taking a break from all the chaos of the world. 
Now, guys, I know how it is. You get this laundry list of things going on in your mind, right? This has got to be done. This has got to be done. This has got to be done. That's what I do. I know from experience. I got all this stuff I know that has to be done, and then it just continues to build up. Even when I check one off the list, it continues to go. Jesus knew there was stuff that needed to be done too. He knew that there was a message that needed to be preached. He knew that there was people out there that needed to be healed. He knew there was sick and lame. He knew there was people that were possessed. But he still took the time, set it aside, and rested. And guys, as servants of Jesus Christ, we have got to take the time to rest. If you do not, you are going to burn yourself out. And that's right, I said it. But listen... You will not burn yourself out from doing the right thing. Let me repeat that again. You will not burn yourself out for doing the right thing. Working for God is, not, is the right thing. Amen? You will burn yourself out for what you do not do. And part of that is rest. Amen? Does that make sense to you guys here this morning? Go back to Hebrews chapter 4. I want to show you something. Hebrews 4. Look there starting in verse 1. It says this. It says, Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest. Let me repeat that one more time. Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. They didn't respond to the gospel, okay? For we which have believed to enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day, on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works, and in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest, seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter in enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. Again he limited a certain day, saying in David, Today, after so long a time, as it is said, today if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. For if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day? Therefore remaineth, therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that is entered into his rest, he also hath seized from his own works, as God did from his. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. Listen to me, guys. If you want true rest... True rest is found in the arms of Jesus Christ. Now what he's talking about here, that rest of God, it's not complete rest from work. It's rest in work. It's partnering with God and doing what He's called you to do by His grace and leaving the part that you cannot do in the hands of God and trusting Him to do it. I want you to look there at verse 3. It says, For we who have believed do enter into this rest. So how do we start this rest, folks? Huh? Say it again real loud. It starts with a B. Believe. How do we enter into this rest? Believe. All right, there's some people here, a few of you. You guys are starting to catch on. I want you to listen to what King David said in Psalm chapter 62, verse 1. It says, My soul finds rest in God alone. My soul finds rest in God alone. God has placed thirst and hungers within your soul that only God can satisfy. Your soul will find true rest in God. How can your soul find rest in God? How can you find rest from bad memories? How can you find rest from guilt? How can you find rest from things that's happened in your past? How can you find rest from anger or your conscience or conviction? You guys remember when you were under conviction? Folks, that'll wear you out. I'm telling you to wear you out. It's just like driving a car. 
You guys ever drove on a long trip, drove that, like down to Florida, it's like a 12-hour drive. You haven't done anything other than sit behind the wheel, but it flat out wears you out. And you're like, how in the world did I get so tired? It's because of mental fatigue. You're constantly having to be on alert when you're driving, right? You see, when you're under the conviction of the Holy Spirit, folks, I'm going to tell you right now, it will flat wear you out. It will make you sick. Your life will be absolutely miserable. If you want rest from conviction of the Holy Spirit, I'm telling you, you can find that rest in the arms of Jesus Christ. That's what people are searching for. They're missing something in their lives, and they try satisfaction in all kinds of different avenues, all kinds of different routes, to, fit, to fulfill that, to get satisfaction from unrest, spiritual unrest. And folks, if you don't go to Jesus Christ with that, it's going to eat at you. It's going to bring you down to your knees till you finally get to the point where you say, you know what, I've got to give my life over to Jesus Christ. This is now something that I've got to do. Folks, for the Christian, ultimate rest is found in Jesus Christ. And He invites all who are wearied and heavy laden. Right? Matthew chap Flip over to Matthew chapter 11 with me. He invites us to cast our cares upon Him. He invites us to come to Him, and we will find complete rest. I'm talking about from the cares of the world. I want you to understand this this morning. Our soul will be restless until it finds Jesus Christ, until it finds rest in Christ. I want you to look at two very familiar verses in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 through 30. The Scripture says this. This is an invitation. This is Jesus speaking. He says, Come unto me. Come unto me. All ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I want you to first notice the audience here. Notice the audience. He says, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, all ye that are wearied, all ye that are burdened. Has anyone ever experienced a burden? Anyone? I have. I've experienced a burden. I'm sure there's probably not many of you guys that have ever read, uh, read a book called Pilgrim's Progress. It was written back in the 1400s, I believe, by an individual by the name of John Bunyan. But the character in Pilgrim's Progress, his name is Christian. In the first half of the book, he's carrying around a burden. And it's essentially a backpack. And he carries around this burden everywhere he goes. He can't get rid of this burden. And he's trying to find... Uh, satisfaction from this burden in all kinds of different places. But the day that he finally gets rid of the burden, it's like a backpack and he takes it off and he throws it and it goes tumbling down the hill and he says goodbye to that burden. It's because he had given his life to Jesus Christ. It's a burden. And the audience here, the invitation goes out to all ye that are heavy laden, all ye that are labored and are heavy laden, wearied and burdened. And this is a call from you to turn from whatever you're relying upon and turn over to Jesus Christ. Listen to me. It's a call to believe in Him. It's a call to trust in Him. It's not a call to a system. It's not a call to a religion. It's not a call to a church. It is a call to Jesus Christ. It's a personal call. That's exactly why in the invitation He says, Come unto me. Come unto me and I'll give you rest. That's what He's saying. He said, I will give you rest. Take His yoke upon you. His yoke is easy. His burden is light. Have you gone to Him? Have you gone to Him for rest? Have you done that? Folks, I know. I, if you guys think the most miserable person on the world is somebody that's lost, you're wrong. The most miserable person walking on the face of this planet is an individual that's out of fellowship with Jesus Christ. It's a person that's in a backslidden condition because they know the lost individual, unless they're under the conviction of the Holy Spirit, hey, life's grand. There's pleasure in sin for a season, right? Everything's good. They're not thinking about these things. But an individual that knows, an individual that was trained up in the ways that they should go when they were a child so that, would, so that they would not depart, those type of people, the person that should not, or, or that's fallen away from Jesus Christ, their, relation is not as, their relationship is not as good as it should be. They're backslidden. That is the miserable individual. That person right there. I know from experience because that was me. Folks, when I was in a backslidden condition, when I was not serving the Lord the way that I should be, I was miserable. 
miserable. Every single day I thought about it. I was under so much conviction, Richard. Now, I know I've told you this before, but if I was flipping through the radio station and a Christian like Walk FM or something was on there, whatever, if I heard preaching and it stopped on there, buddy, I hit that seek button as fast as I could to get it off. You know why? Because I didn't want to hear it. I was miserable. I was miserable. But finally, that day, that day when all the conviction got to me so much, and I was walking down that hallway of my house, and I was holding Cody and looking at Cody. He was just a little tiny baby, and I knew that I needed to be raising that child in church. When it got too much for me to handle, I hit my knees right in that hallway right there, and I rededicated my life to the Lord because I couldn't handle it anymore. The pressure and the conviction was too much. I was a miserable individual. I know there's somebody here today that, that that's you. There's somebody here today that I'm speaking to. Now, I'll tell you this. This message on rest, I didn't realize until just a few minutes ago when I began to think I was, I was just preaching that. that. That message is for me. That message was for me. But what I'm talking about now, that message is for somebody else. That's for you. There's somebody here that's fallen away. There's somebody here that's not serving Him and you know that you're supposed to be. You know if you're serious or not. We don't know. Only you and God. But the invitation, He says, Come unto Me. All ye that labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Take My yoke upon you and learn of Me for I'm meek and lowly in heart and you shall find rest for your souls. I want you guys to notice something before I close. There's a connection between labored and heavy laden, wearied and burdened, and an unbeliever. You see, this call is really going out to unbelievers. If you're an unbeliever here today, I don't want you to miss this connection. You may not know it yet, but you are wearied and you are burdened. Do you know that? There's only one place that you can find rest for that. And that is in the arms of Jesus Christ. Right. One way, and that's it. There's one. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come to the Father but by me. Church, servants, you've been wearing yourself out all week at VBS. You know what you need? Rest. You need to rest. You need to take time. You need to set it aside. You need to rest your bodies. You need to rest your mind. Get into the Word of God. Amen?